Good evening. My name is Vita Morgan. I am the Senior Director of Engagement, Diversity, and Opinion at the Courier Journal. Thank you so much for joining us in this discussion on the roots and the reach of systemic racism. Our goal is to help inform people about systemic racism and to talk about what it will take to eliminate it. By way of definition, systemic racism refers to public policies, institutional practices, and cultural norms that have both intentionally and unintentionally reinforced advantages for white people and disadvantages for people of color. Systemic racism can be found in every sector of society, including health and education, employment, housing, and criminal justice. The death of Breonna Taylor, an unarmed black woman killed by Louisville police in her home nearly a year ago, has brought these issues to the forefront, but they have long existed across our city, our state, and our nation. Thank you to our panelists for taking the time to be with us for this important discussion. With us today, we have T. Gonzalez, Director of the Center for Health Equity in the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness. T. came to the center in 2010 to coordinate the department's Racial Healing and Equity Initiative. Thank you, T. We also have Ricky Jones, professor, political philosopher, and chair of the Pan-African Studies Department at the University of Louisville. He also writes a column that appears bi-weekly in the Courier Journal. And we have Tracy K. Meyer, professor at the University of Louisville and co-director of the Oral History Center her research interests center on modern U.S. social movements, especially against racism and the role of progressive faith-based activism. Tracy will only be with us for the first half of the show. She has a class to teach. Kish Kumi Price is also with us. She is Director of Education Policy and Programming at the Louisville Urban League, where she fights for educational and social justice for youth and their families. Kish has also written a few op-eds for the Courier Journal on Education. We appreciate her insights. Thank you and thank you all again for being with us. And we'll jump right into it. I will start out with uh, some questions and we will also take questions live for those who are watching this and thank you for joining us. And we'll start with Tracy. You wrote a book about the history of the civil rights movement in Louisville and some people think racism has ended with that movement. Can you talk about systemic racism um, and how it's still at play here in our city? Yeah, I think it's good when we talk about um, systemic racism to start with the historian because um, really by its nature, um, systemic racism is the result of decisions, practices, policies that over a long period of time have sort of um, baked inequality into the system. Um, and, and, and as you started off by saying um, at the start of your introduction, we could talk about this in all kinds of sort of parts of life. Um, I thought because I didn't want to take up too much of everybody's time that I would uh, just focus on two areas that most of my own research is on and that have been particularly prominent in, um, in ways that help us understand the way the movement in, for equality in Louisville has played out. Um, and those are housing and education. Um, and one thing I would say is a lot of people have seen or by now have heard of the old redlining maps. Um, and this is the way that um, government policy gave preference to loans for certain neighborhoods and not for others and for certain people and not for others. And so a lot of people have heard of the redlining map. Um, what's interesting is if you look at a map of the Democratic Republic today, um, there's a remarkable overlap with those old 1930s um, redlining maps. And one of the that things one of the things that that really reminds us of, I think, is that there have been sort of decisions that were made by builders, bankers, real estate agents, um, you know, all through the later part of the 20th century are still kind of written into our community today in terms of where people live um, and don't live. And um, we see the effects of that still. So one of the things I think is most, is particularly interesting, and this goes to something you started off with, is 
uh, if we look at the West End today, which is, I think, stereotypically considered, you know, a lot of people see it as where the majority of African Americans live. That's not necessarily true, but that's a, a, a stereotype in the community. Um, uh, the reason that um, whites moved out of the West End in the first place was because of the arrival and the expansion of industry there, particularly the chemical industry. And that opened up space that African Americans moved into. Well, we still see that in health impacts today, right? Where the ge a geographer a colleague of mine at U of L documented the increased rates of asthma, for example, among children in the West End. We see this disproportion in um, economic development um, in the West End, where the same redlining maps that discouraged um, investment in new building or repairs on private residences, that also affects um, the investment in commercial establishments. So you can still see today the sort of lingering effects of the relative lack of good services and amenities in the area. And of course, this intersects with schools, which is one of the subjects of one of my books. So it's a subject that I like to talk about a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, people say, oh, well, busing took care of, um, overcame the segregation of residences to integrate the schools, except that even there you could see built into the system right from the from the 70s, but certainly more even more so in the 80s, a system that was used for busing that uh, was really designed to appeal to white and, uh, and middle class East End parents and keep them invested in the system by primarily busing black students out of their neighborhoods or away from their homes. Um, so you can see how um, again, decisions that were made in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s are still uh, sort of written onto our city today. Um, and just so that nobody watching thinks, oh, but those, that's all in the past. We shouldn't talk about the past so much. Of course, as a historian, I want to talk about the past. But, um, but as you know, even if we look at studies after the 2008 housing crisis, we see banks following policies that disproportionately use predatory lending um, and subprime uh, mortgages in the West End. Um, even today, as the school system is adopting a new policy for student assignment that will allow more West End students to choose to stay near home, there's no part of that policy that encourages white students from the East End or, or non-Black students from the East End to go into those neighborhoods. So while we can look at the history that got us here, we have to remember that these policies are, are continuing um, in different forms. Right? Thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Tracy. And the, the uh, comment you're making about education actually is a good segue into uh, Kish. Right. <laughs> Kish, can you talk with us about to how you see uh, systemic racism playing out in education? Absolutely. Thank you for having me here. Um, I would echo what Tracy said and um, really just emphasize that public education is a perfect example of systemic racism. So when you talk about inequities being baked into the framework, um, that is exactly what we are dealing with in public education. And specifically here in Jefferson County, um, I think it can be acknowledged that race equity is one of the pillars guiding the work and the um, strategic approaches of the district. However, when it's just a pillar, it continues to be this um, thing that is given importance at times, but not all the time, right? So if it's embedded in the framework and not just a pillar, then it guides everything that you do. It guides if you're going to reopen schools or not. It guides um, who, who gets what, when, and how much investment is made in um, students. And so we see that playing out in so many ways um, within uh, education, and it has to do with, you know, who's educating our students. It has to do with uh, curricula, who wrote the curricula, like who, who, who was at the table making the decisions, who's making the policies, who's um, carrying out those policies in the ways that they were written, um, what are the practices that are being used, and who's guiding those. So um, there are things that I think we think we can celebrate, you know, for instance, I think um, there's been some national recognition even over the race equity analysis tool that's used to guide um, the policies and procedures that are 
uh, currently um, being developed or you know changed within the system. But that process is only as good as who's at the table to do the analyses. And traditionally, the people at the table are not representative of this, the school population. So you don't have a lot of black and brown folks at the table um, making these decisions. There are not a lot of black and brown um, parents um, in the, at the school-based decision-making council. They're, they're not even comprised in that piece. And so there's usually this caveat that you need to have minority representation. But when the minority representation is just that in the minority, how, how are you going to really see that system change? How are you going to really see um, the advocacy efforts actually amplified in the ways that we need it to be amplified? And um, Tracy brought up a really beautiful example that we're working um, to advocate for families right now with the student assignment plan. We all know anybody who has a child that's in JCPS or who has been through this system knows that the student assignment plan, um, the past one was uh, a hot mess, right? For lack of better words. And um, moving forward, the hope is that we don't have to choose between bad and worse, that we actually have a good plan on the table, that there, that families aren't having to decide, okay, do I want my child to go to this school across the city and have maybe an access to better um, educational opportunities, but if they wanna be involved in anything after school, we can't swing it, we can't make it. Like we, we should not have to choose. And um, so you see that playing out in so many ways where, um, we're dealing with the mess of what, what what came before us. And when we talk about systems, usually it seems like it's this nebulous thing, right? That we all can acknowledge, but systems are people. Systems are policies, systems are procedures. And we have to call that out. We have to call the people out that are making the policies and the procedures and ask who's at the table. And then for those of us who are at the table and, and representing, we have to ask, are we there and acknowledging that as a privilege to be at the table or are we advocating for those tables to be flipped and for those tables to represent who needs to be at, who needs to be there? Thank you, Kish. Some, some, some good, excellent points raised there that we will definitely get back to. Um, to go to T next. Um, uh, T in the center of health Course, you refer to systemic racism as the roots of a tree um, affecting health. Can you explain that? Yeah, so one of the one of the ways that we describe how health happens, um, you know, we're focused on public health, so we want to look, take a wide lens of like what's happening in our community. Um, so one of the ways that we describe how health happens is, is to look at a tree. Um, and if you think about a tree, um, you know, what's most visible to us, a part of the tree that's most visible to us is, you know, what's happening in those leaves and branches, right? So if we, if we take a look at a tree that way, we would think of, we think of that as like how we see health outcomes, right? So this is, you know, what's happening with, um, with asthma per se, somebody mentioned asthma. So what's happening with asthma, what's happening with heart disease and cancer within our community, right? So these are the outcomes that we can see, the leaves of the tree. Um, you know, but just like, just like a tree, our, our health, um, you know, starts in the roots. And, and for us, we can call these uh, root causes of health. Uh, some people call them social determinants of health. Um, but so if you look in the roots of the tree, um, that's where you'll find some of the things that, that have already been mentioned here. So education being a, a significant um, root cause of health, right? So what's the quality and your access to education? Um, housing was mentioned. Um, so not just whether or not you have housing, um, is that housing affordable so it's stable for you? Um, but also what's the, the quality of that housing? Um, you know, the internal quality of your housing um, uh, can determine certain health outcomes, you know, asthma being one of them. Um, so the important thing to think about when we're talking about these root causes, because then we're going to take it another step further um, as we think about racism, uh, 
the roots, so be things like education, housing, transportation, um, healthcare, and so on, um, all of these systems, everyone experiences them, access to them one way or another. Um, so uh, what we're talking about, what we want to focus on is, you know, how are people in different communities experiencing those systems? So, you know, everyone in our community, one way or another, is uh, touched by um, our education system, right? You're either a parent or an adult that cares about somebody who's in there or you're a student in there. Uh, you're the product of that system, right? So everyone is touching that system one way or another, or you're hiring people from that system, right? Um, but how are you experiencing um, our education system that we have uh, in this community or in this country, right? Um, not everybody is having the same experience. Um, and that can go school building by school building, right? Or whatever district you're in. Um, so uh, we wanna think about how people are experiencing these, these root causes of health. But then, so part of the answer to that is how people are experiencing is really shaped by the soil, right? So we have the leaves of the tree, then we have these roots, um, and then we get into the soil. And the soil is actually shaping the overall health of this tree um, and, and really creates what's possible um, uh, in, in order to like come out of that tree, right? And what are the health of the roots? Um, and this is where we find what we call systems of power um, and certainly, um, you know, institutional and systemic racism being a key system of power operating within our society um, really shapes how people are experiencing um, those different uh, uh, root causes of health. So, uh, you know, Dr. Kmeyer at the beginning talked about the history leading to, uh, you know, redlining history and the way that today, right, it's not um, just in the past, but today actually impacts, um, you know, the housing opportunity uh, and quality of housing that people in our community and across this country have. Um, so, uh, in the soil there, baked into it, like everyone is saying, is, is shaping um, this huge factor, uh, a root cause, social determinant in our community, housing, um, and then how you experiencing that, uh, not just in the past, but today, um, it has really been shaped by uh, systemic racism uh, in this community and across this entire country. Thank you, T. Uh, Ricky, Ricky, um, you teach and you write and you speak about these issues. Um, you've done so for years. Um, why is it important to talk about these problems, these issues? Why is it important to teach about it? Uh, and how? what do you hope to accomplish in, in what you do? I think there are a few things, Vita. One, you teach about it because a lot of people don't think systemic racism exists at all. You know, they feel that America really is the, the home of the free, land of the brave. We have equal opportunity and everything is based on, you know, individual effort. So if you fail, it's simply because you did not work hard enough and there is no institutional engagement. You know, so 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 that's one. Two, Kish brought up an incredible point, a lot of incredible points when you all engage education. I'm an educator and I think at the heart of this is what is education about? What is it teaching our children? And what's it's teach, what has it taught people who are now adults and they're plugged into the system at various levels? We have to face the fact that we have literally good percentages of generations of people who are lost. They're done. It's over. We, we, we're just not going to be able to recover them. That's a sad reality to face. And I, I resisted it for a long time, but it's real. And so the question is, what are we going to do in educational systems to help as many of our children as possible have the best shot at moving forward. That's at the heart of it. We're releasing a piece, a shameless plug for the Courier Journal. You know, my piece that's, that'll be online tomorrow is about American education and how it's damaged black students and black educators. And so if people understand the history of this as we go back to, to my colleague, Tracy K. Myers point at the beginning, people wanna tie things up in neat bows for instance, so you go to 1896, you have Plessy versus Ferguson that establishes separate but equal and Jim Crow in this country. And then folks want to say that in 1954, when Brown versus Board um, destroys Plessy and schools are, are integrated, 
per se, at all deliberate speed when when segregation in schools is no longer legal, then that's the end of the story. But it's not the end of the story. I mean, we have Americans, we have school systems all over this country that did really, really nasty things. One of the things that they did was they pretty much fired all of the black teachers for the most part. So they were wiped out of the system. So you had, you know, generations of black children learning in school systems where curricula didn't speak to them and had teachers who across lines of race pretty much didn't care about them. And that's still going on to this day. And the article talks about a 2016 Johns Hopkins study that says when when evaluating the same black student, the same black student, a white teacher will think that that student is 30 percent less likely to attend college and graduate from a four year college and 40 percent less likely to even graduate high school than a black teacher. We're talking about the same student. So why do I teach these things? I think it's very important that at every level of education, K through 12 and in higher education, one, we have black students who see themselves rep represented both in curricula and in front in the classroom so that they don't suffer from these inferiority complexes and be written out of history. And two, that our white students understand that they are suffering from a superiority complex because they've been overrepresented educationally. So that's at the heart of what I do, because I think education is one of the factors that sits at the heart of what we see as systemic uh, institutionalized racism. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you. Those are uh, again, some, some good points to consider. Um, and we'll get back to, to some of the solutions. Before uh, Tracy uh, leaves us, I wanna uh, ask her uh, one more question. Tracy, as we're looking at uh, kind of, we've, we've kind of laid out the problems as we're looking at solutions. Talk to me a little bit about what you see as um, what we need to be doing next. Mm -hmm. Uh, combat systemic racism? Well, and I think that one of the things that um, uh, has been sort of clear here is that, you know, because it is embedded in all these different systems, there's not one overall answer, right? Um, uh, you know, I think that, you know, at heart, um, one, of the, one of the things that um, was said earlier um, was the idea that, yes, it's systems, but it's people too, right? And it's people making the policies, people acting on the policies. And that's actually one thing that I would add is that, you know, we, when we talk about systemic racism, we want to be careful not to leave it as this sort of static, it exists, and so we have to confront the system. It exists because people continue to support it, right? And keep people continue to act on it. Um, and uh, so you, so I think that there's, you know, one is that there's no one solution to that, but also um, any solution involves what Ricky was saying about sort of, uh, actually, I thought that was really interesting when he just said about um, these, th this education isn't just aimed at black students to understand, you know, their, their history and their position and, and, and institutional racism from their perspective, but it's aimed at white students so that, that white people can understand the way that they have bene benefited from these. Because I think that we still have, and I'm gonna get on my soapbox, I'm sorry, but we still have such a pervasive, um, uh, you know, uphill battle, I think, to, to make sure that sort of most, more Americans understand that this is a, um, that they benefit from from this, that they, you know, that they are in part responsible uh, from this. You know, we still have, you know, opposition to building um, multifamily uh, mixed income housing projects in different parts of the county, right? And that is not just systemic racism, that's people have, making that decision to, to oppose that. So the, the pie in the sky, idealistic side of me says one of the uh, solutions or one of the things is sort of this that sort of public culture changing. And I do think that there was some signs over the summer that, um, and I remember actually I did an interview with a career journal reporter about this, um, uh, uh, about, uh, you know, some signs of shifting in the culture, in the popular culture. And I am a cup half, half full person, not a cup half empty person. We had trouble saying that. Um, so I like to be optimistic. I like to see, okay, you know, we have to work on culture change. But beyond culture changes, you have to work on policy and very specific policy. So like one of the things that I've really been advocating in this sort of, um, in the school system part of things is, um, you know, if we want to shift to allowing West End students more options of schools in the, um, 
west and southwest parts of the city so that they can be closer to home to sort of take care of that problem that Kish was talking about before with the can parents get there, right? Um, you also have to build into that magnet programs in those schools and uh, extra educational experiences and extra educational resources in those schools to attract people to stay in them, right? And that is a, a very, I think so much of the policy changes, one, they have to take place in different areas, but also they're really sort of day-to-day -day policies. I mean, if you're looking for some big solution, um, there is no big solution. It's day-to-day -day policy on the ground solutions. And that's a way why it's hard because it's hard to generate enthusiasm and movement around getting black parents onto the site-based decision-making councils, which, right, which my school, my kids' school is doing right now, is dealing with right now. That's not something that's going to get a lot of TV and a lot of media coverage, but it's those kinds of small policy changes that I think are really vitally important. So policy changes and cultural changes. And it's like working from the very top or the very big cultural change to the very small, those, those incremental policy changes. And I have to go to class. Thank you, Tracy. Sorry. Being with us and and uh, have a good good class. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, you all. Enjoy the rest uh -huh. of it. Okay. All right. We're gonna we're gonna go uh, back to education and with uh, Kish, um, and talk again about solutions. Um, Kish, what changes do you see that we need to make um, in education uh, to attain that equity that um, we are hearing? You know that you spoke about and that the you know the district the school district has spoke about. Um, how do we how do we get over this, this hurdle so that our children of color are achieving? Yeah, I, th I think um, one of the ways would be to acknowledge the um, fake ignorance, if you will, of um, people who are making the decisions and not understanding how they will impact um, equity issues. And so what I mean by that, um, if you're familiar with the podcast, Nice White Parents and understanding how you at times can be in this space of seeing um, yourself as a white parent um, doing something that's for the good for, for all kids. But you're really trying to hold on to those privileges that you have for your children and not really understanding the impact that it's going to have on other children, right? Other being black and brown kids. And so um, a lot of, because of the systemic issues that we're talking about, which are wide and vast. And if we're talking about this, I think the Louisville Urban League really hones in on each one of those pillars of jobs, justice, education, health, and housing. So if you're talking about the parents who are usually able to, um, you know, have the most time to beat down the doors or, you know, call incessantly about a problem. Um, those are the folks who can afford to do that, right? And that's because of systemic issues, right? That um, they have that privilege and power. And when I say power, I'm talking money usually um, to be able to shift the narrative and how things happen in the public education system. So what we think should be the norm is usually not the norm. So even if we're talking about funding for a particular school, um, that funding is a, it is a bucket that we can all see, but then there are other streams of, of revenue um, or income that aren't really talked about, right? So that's how we end up with the private public schools, right? Those are the schools where you know, the families have uh, really invested in the PTA. You know, there's all this extra funding for X, Y, Z. And then you have the, the schools that are the high need schools that don't have those extra buckets. So when we start talking about equity and the difference between equity and equality, I think everybody kind of glazes over like, yeah, we got it. We get it. We know the difference until you start talking about reallocating resources. So when you start talking about moving money, then all of a sudden it's, whoa, hold up. And that's where you have the push from the nice white parent syndrome, right? And so that would mean that if we were being serious about addressing these systemic issues, we're not just talking about the info, the um, 
in just in uh, injecting, I guess I would say, of funds, more money, like we need more money in the system, right? So we had um, so many people talking about not wanting to um, invest in the, the tax or support the tax rate increase, because why should we give the district more money? They have enough money, right? Um, and that argument um, is somewhat valid in that you're you're not looking at what you already have. Have you reallocated the resources the way that you need to? But then to act as if we have what we need, we know we don't. We know that students need so much more. I mean, you can look at any school in this district and recognize that there are needs that have gone unaddressed for so many years. And the majority of those schools that need attention are the schools that are considered our high need schools. So it is an insult um, to say, why do you need more money? If, if you have anything of value, you invest in it. So whenever the city or the state or the, the federal government decides not to invest in education, we have a true problem, right? And that, that is, that is continuing, continuing that narrative of systemic racism and what that really means because usually when people think public education, they are thinking, well, those are the black and brown kids or the kids that are um, you know, low income or what, you know, and then if we have this, cause we're talking and let me give numbers here so people understand what I'm saying. Cause I'm not saying that's the, the whole story. I'm just saying that here in, in Jefferson County we have 100,000 students um, approximately within the, the school district and 70% are title one eligible. So 70,000 of the 100,000 students in the district are considered title one eligible meaning free and reduced lunch eligible, right? And so when you look at that divide and then you understand that that 30,000, most of them are good because those are the kids of the nice white parents or the privileged black and brown parents that are saying, well, my child's good. Uh, they're getting a good education. And we are, to, to um, <laughs> Dr. Jones' point, um, at a loss for even understanding what good is anymore, right? Because we've been through this system of um, indoctrination of colonization, right? Of thinking that there's the white way. And the closer you get to assimilating to white culture, white curricula, then you're considered an, an elite student you're considered to be the one that they're gonna to ask to speak before everyone um, on behalf of JCPS students. But that's not, that's not equitable education. So we need to invest. That's, that's the bottom line. Okay, so, the, so it's, it's money, it's putting more resources and also you investing in people because you're talking about also having diversity at the, at the top as well. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Um, and also just on talking still about uh, solutions, uh, I'd like to move over to T and talk about as it relates to um, what do you see there, T, as solutions for achieving equity and overcoming this um, systemic racism? And you talk about this tree and there's, there's a lot there. I mean, how do we kind of get, <laughs> how do we dig that up? Yeah, and there's so much good that has been said. And I, I really appreciate what everyone else has, has said, you know, Dr. Kamara Jones, uh, you know, in, is a giant uh, in the field of public health, you know, the, the field that I'm in. Um, and, and she really describes, you know, racism, systemic racism as, um, you know, the way that our society is structured that um, unfairly um, disadvantage, concentrates disadvantage for some and, and therefore also unfairly concentrates advantage for others. Um, so part of what happens, in, and I think is, you know, kind of been alluded to by, by everyone else, is that um, I, I think the solutions are before us. We actually, there are some people um, in our community and across the country who are already experiencing what the solutions are, right? Um, they have quality housing. Um, they have uh, access to quality education and the resources it takes in order to progress through that quality education, right? They um, have uh, safe working environments that pay them 
uh, good wages um, and um, you know protect them while they're on the job. Um, so a lot of these solutions, we already there are already people in our community um, and broadly who are already experiencing them. So the solutions are not actually um, a mystery. They're actually they're hidden in plain sight, right? Um, you know, I think from uh, from a public health perspective, like specifically thinking about. Um, some health solutions, you know, one of the things that's been, um, has been previously, but uh, through any time we have a flu season or we had a, a hep A outbreak a couple of years ago here in our community, but especially considering over this past year as we're in this pandemic, um, you know, one of the policies that I think um, is important for us as a community to consider um, is about ensuring paid sick leave for workers. Um, there are about 30 cities or so across the community who have taken this on. Um, it should be understood that there are millions of people across this country who do not have access to even one paid hour of sick leave, not one hour um, for the labor that, that they do, um, cannot take off one paid hour of work if they are sick. Um, and that's not just, um, that's just not bad for, for the worker. That's actually bad for the rest of us, right? Like, so any of us in this past year be like, hey, if you're sick, right? Like if we have to engage with each other, um, we want you to stay home. But people have, uh, you know, rent that they have to pay and they have to eat um, in order to, to live. Um, and so they're not able to do that. Um, and, you know, I think one of the important components that there are some policy, uh, a lot of policy discussions emerging uh, right now that um, the people are like, oh, well, this would be good during the pandemic. And the reality is that these are policies that would be good for our public health, like before the pandemic, and they will be good for the public's health long after this pandemic is over, right? So people having access to safe working environments, right? And all the different ways that that, that means, right? Like, do they have the proper protective equipment? Um, do you have access to, um, you know, be able to to take off if you're sick? Uh, and, and are we paying you well for the labor that you do? There have been people in our community who um, have over this past year continue to work in the grocery store, continue to show up to work in meat packing plants, um, continue to uh, clean our facilities everywhere. And these are the exact same people who uh, are the least likely to have access to paid sick leave as an example of a public policy that, that we should pursue um, and who are also disproportionately people of color, right? So it's two things. So in that regard, it's like there's a policy that we could take that's good for literally everybody, um, but also is a part of recognizing that um, people of color are more likely to be in jobs where they don't have these kind of protections. That's a step towards uh, racial equity that we can take, even though it would benefit anybody, right, who is is working and is, you know, meets certain uh, you know, eligibility or whatnot, right? There, you know, different communities have different policies, but um, you know, I think that's the the recognition is that actually, like working towards racial equity, we say is about actually um, improving. Like we want to improve the conditions for everyone, um, but it can have this specific focus, like saying, you know, that there's disproportionately people of color working these types of jobs. Um, it can have that additional benefit, right? So, um, and I think we have to do some reframing in our mind, in our community um, about what um, racial equity, racial justice is. Um, and I think, you know, there's oftentimes this, I think, misunderstanding that it will mean, you know, we have to take from others in order to do this or it'd be worse outcomes, you know, for others in, in order to advance conditions for everybody. It's like there really are solutions that um, can benefit uh, the people who need it most, but also has this other ripple effect that is good for all of us. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the challenges that we have um, in order to be able to move some of these, these policy and budgetary decisions, like, like Kish was saying, it's like, 
you know, if we really want to have the community that we want, where everybody can can thrive, we're going to have to make some different decisions um, than we have been than we have been making. Are there T? Are there places that are are getting it right when it comes to these issues? Well, what I will say is that is there there's no. <laughs> There's no place in the United States or anywhere in the world that has totally figured this out, right? Um, I, I do think that there are there are communities um, and city governments um, who, um, you know, are taking on, uh, you know, having racial equity strategies, right, um, and uh, holding government institutions accountable, but then also public, like other public institutions. We, you know, we're talking about JCPS, right? Like. Um, and so uh, it's not, uh, I will say that this type of work inside institutions is not uh, flashy. It's, uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, what, you know, probably what Dr. K. Meyer and what Kish were kind of said. It's literally every day um, looking at uh, decision points every single day um, and making that commitment that, like Kish was saying at the beginning, it's like, it's not just one of the pillars, but it's like really in the framework or the foundation of how you're operating. Um, so, you know, I think for a long time, like, I, you know, uh, Seattle city government has had their race and social justice initiative and, and other cities are, are taking that on as well. I'm just having a discussion today about the work that Austin, Texas is doing. Um, so there, there really are, there's nobody that's perfect um, that doesn't exist with this type of work. Um, but I think it's like that day-to-day, -day, like every single day commitment uh, and making these uh, investments in the resources and budget. And then also that complementing that with these policy decisions, which really can change the reality for people's day-to-day -day lives. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, question then uh, turning to Ricky. Uh, Ricky, if this community then is serious, I guess, and that's an if about ending systemic racism. What uh, what does it need to do? Be clear about what we're talking about. Be clear about the arguments and, and be clear about framing it. I personally think, Vita, that this session that we're having ostensibly is really about education as a tool to address systemic racism and inequality. It quite often comes back to education. I don't think people understand how much it comes back to education because what education does is it gives people the opportunities to have more choices in their lives. That's really what it's about in a capitalist society. If you earn an associate's degree, you're gonna degree you're gonna make if you just make it pragmatically about capital, about money. If you earn an associate's degree, research shows you're gonna earn more money than you will if you have a high school diploma, bachelor's degree more than an associate's degree, master's more than a bachelor's doctorate you know more than a, than, than a master's the more education you have the better off you are period but what's so nasty about you know the generational effects of american institutional racism is people are stunted at every level so when when tracy was talking about you know the struggles in getting black parents to get together with community decision-based teams at, at school Largely because they haven't had access to the education that's given them the flexibility to get to those meetings, right? Just like Kish said, you know, most people who have their children in these schools, they are out working one, two, sometimes three jobs at a time just to make ends meet. So there's a class dimension to it, right? I want to circle back to a question you asked too about how we can address this. And, and, and I want to say this too, and this pisses a lot of people off when folks say, well, college isn't for everybody. If you're taking that stand, all right, I can't help you. I really don't know what it is that you and your children are going to do or what you want for your children. And I'm a kid who grew up in the housing projects of Atlanta. And my grandmother never went to school who raised me. And she always told me, I don't know what you can do with an education, but I know what you can't do without one. So everybody Nobody should ever say college in for everybody because your kids are going to serve. All right. That's that's really the, the raw of it. So people are talking about this are talking about sending their children to, to trade schools while elite whites in this country are literally going to jail and prison trying to get their children into certain universities 
because they know it's going to give them a leg up. What can we do to fix it? The first thing that every school system in this country should do, K through 12 and in higher ed, is totally rebuild their curricula because their curricula are totally based on European centered ideas that wipe everybody else off the table for consideration from social studies, you know, to, 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 to history, to everything. They wipe everybody else off the table. Those curricula need to be scrapped and rebuilt from ground up so that every, every group of people are legitimately represented so children see themselves in the curriculum. That's one. Two, and this is simple. If, if studies show that black children specifically perform better, have higher expectations from black teachers, why wouldn't you hire more black teachers? When you understand the history of what American education has done to black K through 12 teachers and black professors at the higher ed level, why wouldn't you have targeted nationwide initiatives to bring in more black teachers? Until you do that, you, you got problems. So you need more black administrators and not the ones who've been shot through the system and no longer remember that they're black and that there's a real institutional problem, but people who actually have their fingers on the pulse of, the, of their communities. Those two things, curriculum and uh, teachers and, 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 and professors at the higher ed level and the K through 12 level, they're absolutely essential. And I am begging people, begging people, please understand the value of education, even if you don't have one. Don't tell your kids college ain't for everybody and, and send them off to something else because it's going to put them at, at a different level. I, I really do believe that education is the road to equality. So you're agreeing. You think education is the equalizer then you're saying in the long run, education is the great equalizer. It is a generate. It's a game changer. Literally in one generation, in one generation, it's a game changer. Right. And, and, if, and if you don't have it, you're going to be crippled. I mean, that's just where it's going to go. So when we talk about, quote unquote, essential workers or people who are in places, you know, factories and such, that they don't even have health uh, equipment to keep themselves safe. People who are working drudgerous hours that are beating down their bodies, beating down their minds. They're dying early. That's usually because they do not have the educational credentials that give them the access to other jobs. Right. That are going to give them the flexibility to pay more attention to their children, that are going to give them the flexibility to pay attention to their own lives, to have the health care that they need. All of these things. These are people who are undereducated and folks don't want to talk about that. And we have people of color who are disproportionately undereducated in this country, black people in particular. And so that is a problem. That is a huge, huge problem. And I think everything that we're really talking about circles back to that eventually. The more educated you are, the greater your chances are of avoiding those pitfalls in life. And let me say this, the system has been designed in such a way that it has deliberately, deliberately crippled and left black people out. There is a reason for that and it's racism. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, we look at it at every level. You know, the story I told you about Brown versus Board, we had educational systems that fired black teachers all across the board, even here locally. Right. And, and, and we tell this story all the time at the, at the university where I work right now, the University of Louisville, integrated in 1950, brought students in from Louisville Municipal that from 1931 had been the segregated black branch of U of L. So they said they integrated. But they told all the black professors at Louisville Municipal that they were fired except one that they were gonna bring one black professor in and told those professors that they got to choose who the one was who was gonna come to, to the University of Louisville. It was a, a fellow by the name of Charles Parrish Jr. So now Charles Parrish gets celebrated as the first black professor at the University of Louisville, but we forget about all those black professors that L fired, right? And we still have a paltry number of black professors at the University of Louisville in 2021. So some of this stuff isn't that complicated. And I tell my colleagues at UofL all the time, if you really, really, really want to be anti-racist, if you really want to have representation that is going to change the face of the university, you need to hire more black professors because you've never, ever done it since this school integrated in 1950. OK, those are real world examples. So we still have, Vita, you know, the, the, the white supremacy at work. Right. And, and I tell people all the time what white supremacy is, is white people's idea that they have the right you know, some type of monopoly on thinking, knowing and deciding. 
So whenever problems like this are presented, even if black people, I mean, educated, skilled black people like Kish, myself and others are saying, look, this is the problem. White people still feel like they got the right to tell you, well, nah, we can tell you more about racism than you can. You can tell us. And so we know what's best in solving these problems if they really want to solve it. That's that's why supremacy, we see it all the time. All right, let's get let's uh, bring Kish into this uh, conversation as well, since we're talking about education and I feel like you're burning over there wanting to, to comment in, but do you want to talk a little bit about it? Is, is the answer there in education? I mean, some of our research has shown that uh, even uh, folks, you know, African-American people who have, you know, the same uh, degree as a white person are still making less money. Um, Kish, what, what do you, you get in, get in this conversation? Absolutely. I mean, I echo everything that Dr. Jones just said. I mean, I feel like, we're in a space where um, we have to come to terms with what's the reality here, right? So when we talk about um, the need to have more Black educators, at every turn, there's a barrier. So even when you start with the recruitment, um, and you, you know, I know U of L has a program that I actually was a part of, the Minority Teacher Recruitment Project, and turned into um, an initiative, but that initiative was to recruit more black educators. Well, when those educators then enter into the system and their ability or desire to be able to move to the next phase of candidacy is determined by a group of white women who can then say, uh, well, you didn't seem like you had enough zeal. And eh, it seems like, to that that is that's what we're talking about that's systemic racism because at every turn even when you think you have you you can celebrate a win yes we have this program now we're going to be able to recruit and bring more black educators in and get them through the the system and then on to being great educators you get that roadblock then you have the praxis which is the test that educators have to take in order to um, be certified and move on to actually be an educator. And we know that standardized tests and specifically this one is not a great indicator of you being a, 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 an elite teacher, right? So it, why do we even have that in place as a, another barrier, right? Then when they get into the system, let's say they, they jump through all the hurdles and they made it. Now they're in, in the system. You have the teachers union, which has decided that you have to be seniored in order to transfer to a particular school. So you get your assignment and maybe it's not the best assignment for you because of locale or whatever, and you want to go to another school, you can put your name on that list, but you're probably not going to be even considered because you're not seniored, i.e. more than likely white. Because seniored in this school system usually connotes white. So these are the things that we really have to talk about and, and consider and address. I've, I've had conversations with um, educa educators, administrators who see this problem. They know it's a problem. So it's, it's not something that's a revelation. We know it's a problem, but it's not being addressed. So what? how do we even begin to move things forward when there's just constantly these barriers and then there's no movement on the barrier. So it's almost like you really do have to have this strategic approach about, okay, let's look at the pipeline. What, what's here that is keeping our folks from moving forward? And then, but why, why should that have to be the work of the black and brown people who were subjected to this system, right? And it's because, Really, when you boil it down to it, like, yeah, it's it's because the people who are impacted the most are going to be the people who care the most. What we have to do is to get our city, this nation to start understanding what T was talking about, which is that ripple effect. You may think that you don't care, but you need to care. You need to care because the quality of our lives depends on the ability for all of us to have access to the resources that we need, period. It don't matter what color you are. That's what we need. We need access to the resources that we need. Every family wants what's best for their family, period. 
And you shouldn't have to beg, borrow and steal to get that. And so when people can get that in their heads, then maybe, maybe we can start moving some things. So getting that into people's head and, you know, I'll open this up to everybody. I mean, you know, th these issues we've been talking about discussing for for years and years and years, um, you know, what what needs to be done to take those giant steps? I mean, we you talked about even when you talk about education and curriculum, you know, obviously um, JCPS is looking at its curriculum and they're trying to hire more um, black teachers and you know, there, there's some movements that are being made, but what is it, why, why haven't we, why are we still struggling here with these same issues over and over again? I, I don't know, Vita, people can say they're trying to do things. That don't mean they really trying to do things, right? And you talk about your curriculum, who's really addressing your curriculum? Is there really political will in your organization to change your curriculum? Or are you just saying you're addressing curriculum because you know you need to address your curriculum, but you're not trying to change exactly what you're, what you're doing? You know, and I'll say this about Louisville. Louisville better be really, really careful right now. As you start talking about revamping the student assignment plan, people starting to talk about getting rid of busing. Let me tell you this. This city is still pretty much laid out along the same racialized demographic lines in 2021 as it was in 1975 when busing was put into effect to desegregate the schools. So understand the code language. When people talk about neighborhood schools, they're really talking about segregated schools. Now, if you want segregated schools, then that's cool. So, but if, if you don't want segregated schools and you think there's something that needs to be done about that, you better pay serious attention. Some of the conversations that are going on in this city right now around education, diversity, segregation, desegregation, all of this stuff, they are really, really scary. This city, I think, is in danger of going backwards educationally instead of forward. So, you know, I I get really, really leery at, at this point as I get older when people talk about we are working on changing this because there is no real historical evidence that that quote unquote working on this stuff is actually yielding results. And then they get you know lost in the weeds with a lot of these pedantic conversations. And you know, let's be real, you fired the black teachers historically, so hire more black teachers and stop telling me you can't find them. I hear that all the time at every level. We can't find black people to do this. We can't find black people to do that. Okay, hire me. I'll find you some black people. You know, serious business. Hire Kish. She'll find you some black people. There's so many people that will find black people to do the work that you say needs done while you keep finding mediocre white person after mediocre white person after mediocre white person that keeps dumping these systems, you know, over cliffs. Thank you. We are down to just a few minutes, and, and this is a definitely a um, stimulating conversation. Um, and I really appreciate you all coming on here and discussing these really important issues. I want to go to T. Um, there are a lot of people out there who want to get involved, who want to help in some way. Um, what would you say to the individual person like who says, like, well, what, what can I do to try to make changes um, in the system? And I'll ask that to each of you, but just starting with T, what what would you advise for that person who wants to help? You know, well, well certainly I'm willing to engage, you know, any of our community members who, who want to. And, it, you know, you can look at healthequityreport.com and, and that's a find a way to connect with us. But, you know, I think for the type of change that we're that we are needing in our community and across this country, we've talked about a lot of public policy issues like we need healthy and robust democracy in order to make that happen. And so I would say, you know, there are local changes, not everything that is needed can be enacted here or, you know, legislated locally, but there are local uh, pieces of legislation that can um, help people in our community while we're waiting for political will at the state and federal levels, right? Um, so I think engaging with your elected officials about things like paid sick leave, um, you know, I think is is a place that people can start. It's a tangible ask of what we can do within our community. Uh, other communities have done it. Um, you know, so I think engaging on those that that's something that I care about, but you may care about something else. Um, so engaging with your elected officials about that, we need 
uh, that robust democracy in order to move forward and, and to simply have the will to do it. Um, because the solutions are right there. There's, it's not a secret what the solutions are. It's really about the will um, to make them happen. Thank you. Kish, what can the average person do? Yeah, I mean, I actually um, agree with what T is saying, you know, just really being actively engaged in the process, not just let, letting things go by and not getting um, accurate information, being informed and then advocating. So to that point about even the sick leave, I would go a step further in saying that sick leave needs to also address, you know, mental wellness days, right? So you should be able to take a sick day for mental health. Why? Because why does this really matter to all of us? Well, we we see how the pandemic has um, affected us. Um, but when you talk about even the most vulnerable communities that have been impacted on so many other <laughs> levels that we haven't talked about completely here today, um, we need to be really concerned about complex trauma. And so um, I think that one of the ways to just be involved is to advocate for not just the things that matter to you, but that, that matter to um, those that you, you may not even have uh, in, your, in your contacts, right? Like these aren't folks that you're, you're talking with every day, but you know this is important and this is work that we all need to do. And if there's anything that you hear from me today, I hope that you hear that I'm saying we have to do this together. Like this can't be the lift and the load of the folks that's been beat down for years when we know that this is this is a heavy lift and it's something we all have to do together. We can't call ourselves a compassionate city and keep doing the stuff we're doing. This is not working. We know it's not working, so we have to change. And um, I do wanna uplift our um, president and CEO, uh, Sadiqa Reynolds for just being the visionary that she is. Um, if you have seen and uh, witnessed the sports and learning complex, um, just really understanding the lift that she had to um, <laughs> endure to make that happen. And it's, it's sad that it takes that much um, effort to do something um, that's benefiting our city. So I just, things like that, like just, it's the little things, right? That mean so much. Um, really just figuring out how you can advocate. All of us can do something, right? And for those that got money, you can do a lot, right? Especially those that are investing in nonprofit organizations that are Black-led nonprofit organizations, really um, trusting those Black leaders to do what they need to do um, to bring forth change in our city. Thank you. Ricky, last word. Yeah, yeah, I know we're short on time, Vita. I, I, I'll say this. Um, if, if you're, and, I, and I'm specifically speaking about black folk, right? Because I think every group has to have its organic intellectuals that are speaking for that group. And I do think that it is important that we take license sometimes to talk specifically about black folk and not just, you know, everybody else, you, you know, and, and I respect them, I partner with them, I'm in sympathy with them. But for me, anybody that says that they're trying to make a difference and change things where black people are concerned, when I walk into a room institutionally, organizationally, I'm going to say to them, what does your leadership team look like? How many black folk do you have in positions who are making decisions? They can green light things. They are making the final decisions. And what type of black folk are they? Because it doesn't matter if you have somebody at the table and they're saying the same things that people have been saying at that table for the last 50 or 100 years. And they're just there because they're safe. So I say to anybody who wants to get involved in doing anything, first and foremost, educate yourself, read as much as you can, you know, so you are armed and know what you're talking about. And as Kish said, think about somebody beyond yourself. It is a collective effort. But everybody isn't of good conscience and you have to understand that. Thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists and, and to those watching. We really appreciate it. Um, we uh, ask that you would uh, join us uh, next week at uh, next Wednesday at 5 p.m. when we're going to talk about Breonna Taylor's impact a year later. And we'll be, be joined by Bianca Austin, Breonna Taylor's aunt, by Attica Scott, Kentucky State Representative, and by Amy Hess, Chief of Public Safety for Louisville Metro Government. Again, thank you all so much, especially to our distinguished panelists. We appreciate it and have a good evening. <laughs>